Hey, Gregor Arturo here. I haven't really talked about what I've been working on for a while. I've been sort of uh, really hitting the theoretical drawing boards, figuring out what my next big step is for the Tesla Tower. And a big part has been understanding the extra coil in this system. And so I'm going to elaborate uh, on some of the ideas I've been working on and maybe just jump from here to here. It might not be that coherent, but uh, hopefully uh, someone will jump on my bandwidth, maybe can uh, assist me with what I'm working on. If not, it might just be some pure scientific inspiration for all of you. So, uh, first thing I'll show is there's a coil former, which I held off on. This guy right here probably looks like a William Reich uh, cloud buster with the hexagonal copper tubes, but those are only at the top, and those were going to be used as uh, terminal loads, uh, top terminals. And the idea is to do a hexagrammatic weaving where you go from one, two, three, and you keep weaving your way up. I held off on this for specific reasons when I started doing the math with all the tuning. And so, oh, I realized I turned on my computer and I got none of the things actually open. But the big idea I've been trying to work on it relates to Dan Winter. It's understanding how to create fractal compression within the magnetic field and understanding the electrostatics and the magnetostatics within the system at the same time. And so, usually in our traditional electrical engineering, we're using a constant frequency in that it's oscillating at 60 hertz, say our AC power. Uh, this concept is how do you create variable frequencies within your signal, such as when you listen to sound, audio, coming out of a CD player, you're getting variable signals all the time, it's what creates music. Well the thing is, our energy systems need to be like music. It's the simplest metaphor to use. And with that, um, with that, there's an interaction of the various different harmonics and how they interact with themselves. And when you get into concepts of sacred geometry and, and understanding the golden ratio and things you find in VBM, Vortex-Based Mathematics, a field pioneered by Marco Rodin uh, that I've been working on and uh, supporting him for several years in, uh, you start to see these patterns of how things interact in terms of growth and decay. And so our science is currently held down with the current idea of entropy, that everything decays in the system, but there's also a process of self-organization. How do we get into this self-organization? And so, no, I don't want you. Next, all right. And so, uh, the first thing I will showcase in this little jam study session, I think I need my book. Where's my book? Well, one book I'll show you, this is a book I've been going through for a little bit, people are probably most familiar with, Nikola Tesla's Colorado Spring Notes. And so I've been studying for a long time Eric Dollard's, uh, his uh, book, uh, uh, the, it's a condensed intro to Tesla Transformers. What I didn't realize, a lot of that book came from here, and that Tesla was really right on it in 1899, and understanding what the extra coil does in a system with a primary and secondary and also putting the system completely in series or at least the secondary in series with the primary instead of letting them being uh, only magnetically coupled instead of also electrically coupled and so the idea is the primary and secondary are magnetically coupled and they can be in series and then they're also electrostatically coupled um, but the secondary and the, and the extra coil in the system are not magnetically coupled, they're only electrostatically coupled. And that's the big key concept in this system. And so I don't have my notebook. You know, because every mad genius, he needs a notebook. That's exactly how we go about things. All right, I found it. The magical notebook. Uh, here I opened up to a random page to quote by Sterling D. Allen, if you guys know Sterling D. Allen. Nikola Tesla was not in this for the money. He wanted to give the world free energy. Uh, if we are to implement free energy in the tradition of Nikola Tesla, then we need to replicate not only his science, but his humanity. And so, 
we go to all my crazy lovely notes and doing harmonics, uh, we get into a series, and this is the series I've been working on that's really important. And the idea of this series is that every interval or every frequency um, in this series, the interval between those frequencies uh, decreases or increases um, at doubling or halving. And so it's not the frequencies that are doubling and halving, it's the intervals that are doubling and halving. And so if we use as a reference point 256, and so you can say cycles per second, you can say hertz, um, but you, let's use the the root idea of a harmonic, of a number, the whole number 256, regardless of its reference point, because this can be applied to any harmonic number within a set. And so, uh, if you go to if you use 256 as a root, then we have a root pattern, or the root fundamental, the next one being 257 over 256. And so, uh, that's the first harmonic of, of, uh, or the first, sorry, the, um, it, it's the first harmonic in this set of intervals. So 257 over 256, you can't break it down unless in terms of a lower whole number, uh, lowest uh, common denominator. And so 257 over 256 applied to 256 is 257, uh, is the frequency. So the next one, and you'll start to see the pattern, is 129 over 128. And so I'm having the root from 256 to 128, but you're adding one number on to that. And so we have 129 over 128. If you apply that interval to a root of 256, you get the new number 258. Um, and so you have 256, 257, 258, and, but these intervals are all magically inter intertwined with uh, doubling and halving, or you can even say the square root of two as they're all intri intrinsically related. You know, some might not see the relationship with square root of two and doubling and halving of two or powers of two, but it's all interrelated. And so, uh, next one is 65 over 64, which is uh, 260. And so, if you can also see the progression. We got increased by one, increased by two, increased by four. Um, the next one, 33 over 32, is 264. Now we increase by four from 260, or eight in, in total from the series. And so you're seeing a doubling of the frequency, of the, fre of the interval of the frequency within the series. And then we go up to 17 over 16, 272. Nine eighths uh, is 288. Five fourths is 320. Three over two is 384. Two over one is 512. Three over one is 768. 5 over 1 is 1280, 9 over 1, 17 over 1, 33 over 1, which is taking the, the traditional number of, uh, in the doubling sequence, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, so on, adding a number to it to create this offset. And so, I'm not sure how well you can see it in here. Uh, there's a lot of mismatch um, numbers here, but this is the number sequence I was reading off. And in terms of the harmonic, uh, in terms of it breaking down to the root harmonic of each of these intervals, we have 129 over 128 uh, applied to 256. It's the second harmonic in the series. The next interval is the third harmonic in the series. And I can keep breaking down that number, dividing it by 2 um, to get a higher um, harmonic until I get the root harmonic. And it goes all the way up until you get the ninth harmonic at 2 over 1. And so, here's the interesting thing when you start to play around with this harmonic series, okay? And so, I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see it on my computer. Actually, I can probably just hold this up. But we have uh, the harmonic series being applied. And so, I have a random number here. 14.95, I can change this number. We're going to change it to 17, and you'll see why. And so, I basically made my root 17. Um, and so, instead of 256, I was talking about. And when you do that, you uh, the interval is over here. 
going all the way down. And here is the actual output. And so this is, this is in terms of wavelength, not frequency. They're inversions of each other. And so over here, we have frequencies um, in the this, in this center row here. Uh, but we're using wavelengths because it's more relative to me and doing the, the Tesla tower because it's what lengths am I cutting the wire. And so if we make this base unit 17, the first one that's applied to 257 over 256 is 16.933. And we go all the way down, and the interesting thing is you go to this column next to the wavelength. This is the total of the wavelength. And so the next one are these two add together. We go all the way down, and we come to the, this number highlighted in bold, 144.5. Not exactly 144, but really close, but it's a nice even number. And a number I plug into it, uh, that number is going to be what I consider a whole number or a, it's, it's not a whole number, it's a rational number, as all the other numbers are irrational. And so the interesting thing about this, that is at column 17. And so the 17th interval or 17th iteration in this system uh, creates up to a whole wavelength. Uh, so what's important about that concept uh, big time is my camera. I'm using a music stand for my camera. The interesting thing about this, okay, is you can have a whole segment, okay, a wavelength. And this wavelength is going to say, let's call it a rational number. It's something concrete that we can wrap our minds around. And you can divide it into 17 segments. And each of these segments are of a different length but they're interrelated interval-wise in terms of this having pattern, doubling pattern. And so uh, you're starting to create a fractal system of this harmonic, of this vibration. And so it gets more interesting in that uh, this number next to it, 161.5, that's the 18th interval, and that is if I add a fundamental above the 16.9 or 256, or 257 over 256, this top one, the first interval, and you make it the root, uh, the root being 17 in this one. If I add 17 to 144.5, it's another whole number, obviously. And so here's the interesting thing. I can read it straight out of my notes. Um, Without the root, there are 17 tones. Uh, the interval is 257 to 256 to 257 over 1. Um, that's 257 times the harmonic, uh, which you do 1 over 257 times the wavelength. Uh, and um, the because the wavelength progressively gets smaller. And so the thing that is, that's the eighth harmonic of 17. If I add the root to it, and so that's 18 intervals instead of 17, adding the 256's root, or 17 in the previous example, um, it starts out as 1, 1 um, in the intervals, then 257, 256, all the way up to 257 over 1. Uh, that gives you the, uh, the total number add up is 2432 on 256's root, with, uh, without the root, it's 2176. That, so with the root, it becomes the eighth harmonic of 19. And so you're seeing these little interesting plays between 17 and 19 in this system. Now here's the interesting thing. What happens when you add the 18 intervals to the 17 intervals? Okay, because so 17 intervals, that wavelength, if I take the wavelength of 17 intervals together, uh, that is a, approximately 17 over 2 of the root of say 17 or 256, so I'll just keep using 256. And so that's 8.5. So if you take 256 and times it by 8.5, that gets you 2176 uh, is the relationship in this series. But if I add the, the, the fundamental tone, uh, the root, to this uh, 17 over 2, it then becomes, uh, was it 19 over 2? it becomes uh, 19 over 2 of the, the system. Uh, 
by adding that final one. So not only do you see the eighth harmonic of 19 and the 17th harmonic, uh, or the eighth harmonic of 17, it's also in terms of uh, the actual ratios between the uh, uh, the root, so 256, without it, 72, with it, 19 to 2. But when you combine uh, a 19 over 2 uh, wavelength to a 17 over 2 wavelength, that means a total of 25 intervals. So you have one set of 17 intervals, one set of 18 intervals, which is really like two sets of 17 intervals. 17 2 wavelength, or, or the root, to, with 17 2 uh, wavelength of the root, and then just the root in, in between, the wavelength. And so simple math, 8.5 and 8.5 um, is, seven, is, uh, is 17. And you add the root is 18, and so we have, here you can actually see what I wrote out. And there's the 17 tones. Um, but when you add all 25 intervals together, you have 18 to 1 over the root. And so uh, you can apply this to one coil structure, say the extra coil. And the extra coil has a root of say 256 and then uh, that divides the secondary and the extra coil and the, and the extra coil and the secondary both match with 17.2 over the root. Now I'm going to get some visuals so actually you can start to see what I'm talking about and hopefully the abstractions aren't uh, leading you astray. And so this is Maya. Oh, that's Maya. I've been using this for a while. And so we have the test of tire I've been working on here in this system. And here I'm just going to pull this guy a lot closer. And so it's a tensegrity structure. And so we have those red wires in the center. And there heck and there's six wires going up, uh, uh, just like a hexagram format. Uh, actually, I really can't do both at the same time. And so we have horizontal structures, hexagons, going around this. Those are part of the tensegrity structure cables. Um, and then we have six vertical going up along the sides. And then we have the red wires, which is, you can say, the copper cutting through, and so it skips one of the hexagonal points over the next, forming, doing a triangular rotation. And this one has nine steps in it. It doesn't have the full 17, um, as I started to work on this before I just made that discovery. Um, and I was more interested in the uh, all nine harmonics as the 256 root progressed up through each stage of the harmonics, which doesn't, it doesn't do with all numbers. And that does not mean you have to use 256 hertz as the actual foundation, just 256 uh, as a uh, notational structure. Um, and so, and then you have little top loads up here. And so, here, if I select, there's three of them I've selected. So you can see here at the bomb, those three on the bomb, three of the six that are selected, which are like white and green, those, uh, that, that's the 257 over 256 ratio of the, of the foundation. But if I click on this one right here that feeds into that wire going into the diagonal, that right there you could say is your 256. That's your, that's your root. Um, and so you can almost call that, you know, when I'm saying root, think of that as wavelength. And then this whole structure, this extra coil, is 17 over 2 wavelength. And then we have a secondary, and these are ideas I'm playing with, is we have a triangular coil. And this one is not mathematically correct. I just did something quickly to visualize it, even though everything else is up to this point. Um, but each each side of the triangle is getting progressively smaller. You can see in this uh, cutaway, you can't see it too well, that's layers, um, that's more of a, a planar 
uh, flat, like you have a flat spiral coil that's a planar flat spiral coil. And uh, the idea with this is you're containing the primary and secondary in a toroidal transformer around the extra coil because you do not want them to magnetically couple. And so there's, there's essentially two ways to do that part. And that part includes uh, putting the coils either too far from each other in the same axis, putting them perpendicular to them, the axes to them, a different coil axis, or you, uh, you put one into a toroidal form. And the toroidal form is a closed loop. You can have no leakage of the magnetic field. And so the thing is, if you have the external primary coupling to your system, and this system includes three circuits. And so the tower, you see six circuits, but two, the two opposing sides of that hexagram are linked. They're, they're, the, they're the extreme ends of the system. And there's one picture I can pull up from my Eric Dollar document collection. And he has a balanced coil system is condensed intro to Tesla transformers. And so in that, let's see if I can find it really quickly. Um, well, I can, I can just show some pictures to get people some view of what I'm talking about. Here's his famous little Tesla magnification transformer where you get the dielectric content at the top, the lead Tesla coil, secondary coil, primary loop, and the capacitor, the discharge capacitor. And so uh, another simpler uh, diagram showing the, uh, the capacitor and spark gap uh, discharging the primary, which then magnetically inductively couples the secondary, uh, amplifies the voltage, and then the Tesla coil essentially breaks it. Um, it's a break. Um, but there is a... Here's um, a more detailed analysis showing the earth, the primary, the secondary, the Tesla with the lead and the dielectric antenna. And so there's also this concept of a lead, so I'm talking about the lead between the secondary and the extra coil is that root note. Um, I'm trying to figure out more of the harmonics, I'm not necessarily going exactly by dollar what he's doing. But here's the balanced coil system. Here's just a nice little simple image to show, which is essentially what I'm doing. And as you can see, there's hundreds percent coupling to the primary, but one of the important things with the Tesla coil is understanding you want loose coupling between the primary and secondary. And so how do we get 100% coupling between primary to primary, uh, which these terms can get a little, it's almost like you have a primary secondary, but then the secondary systems you have a primary secondary and extra coil. But uh, I, we can stick to the term of primary primary, external primary, internal primary, and secondary and extra coil. The external primary uh, and the internal primary are both roughly single loop turns and that are great for, they have very little impulse reactance and you want 100% coupling to them, you want these extremely close. And so one of the things with doing a toroidal configuration is you can completely enclose all the magnetic field lines. And uh, there's ways to control the coupling uh, more directly, which is using stepped inductors. And so Dollard even talks about the advantage of using a stepped inductor over a continuous former. And so the, this guy here in the corner, you can see it all the way back, my little Tesla transformer, um, it's stepped inductors. It's six formers, but you're wrapping around three formers. And with the 10 secondary structure, which is based off Buckminster Fuller, and I explained that, that's where those are uh, tension wires and, and rigid supports. And how I'm actually planning on building that is I'm gonna be taking carbon fiber tubes, which are really thin and super strong, and almost like using them like macaroni, <laughs> or uh, like making jewelry beads, and, and having them at the right length, and sliding them onto a piece of copper wire. And then uh, those are the rigid supports because copper bends easily, and so with a larger structure, there's ways I know how to make copper a lot stronger, but with the smaller stuff, copper won't do. Uh, and so, and then where you have like, say, carbon fiber, carbon fiber, you have this little piece of copper sticking out, I can tie some fishing line onto that, 
um, for the vertical and the horizontal supports. And the whole thing will be rigid with a little bit of flex. And so one of the interesting things too is if the structure starts uh, vibrating, it allows it to vibrate more freely uh, without, so it actually the vibration of the structure can, can create a level of resonance to where it doesn't say wiggle the bolts apart or other parts of the structure. The structure is made to vibrate. It wants to vibrate. And so um, one of the things with using a toroidal transformer back to this concept is you have 360 degrees of segment, okay? And so uh, in this picture, you have this one segment here. This guy takes up 15 degrees of this rotation. And this is if I use the flat spiral uh, inductor. Um, I'm really experimenting what ways work best, at least in terms of thought experiments, um, to then, uh, then I can apply the mathematics to the right coil configuration. And so one of the ideas is how in this toroidal transformer do I include an internal primary, external primary, and a secondary um, to where the secondary does not magnetically couple to the external um, primary, or at least only partially. And so one of the great things about using the stepped formers versus continuous is I can make the, uh, so like if you have one triangle here, and say that triangle is the core inside another triangle, um, a bigger triangle, and so the edges of this triangle are touching the midpoints of the sides of the bigger triangle. That means the surface area of the smaller triangle is one-fourth of the larger triangle. And so if, if you have those literally resting right on each other, and they're both inductors, okay, the the primary, only a quarter of its field lines are capable of going through the smaller primary. That would give you a coupling of 0.25. And so you can use geometry to your advantage to control what field lines go in and out of your structure. And so you can almost have, it's having a nested toroidal system where, where you have part of the field lines moving through the secondary and then part of the field lines moving through the internal and external primary in the system. And so you can nest, you can nest all these coils together in this troidal form. Um, and then basically you go from the secondary to the primary and these are, these are electrically connected, which means they're electrostatically coupled would be the terminology. And uh, that these primaries, and so like what I'd actually do in this system is uh, to, for, for balance, this would have two primaries going off either side that it would be um, electrically connected to. And then those two primaries would then each have a ground wire coming off of them, connecting to the two other primaries on the exact opposite side of this coil. And the midpoint of those two wires are one wire. I might use two because the idea is to try to create symmetry in this system. Uh, we could then be connected to a ground. And so the ground uh, is your neutral point in the system. And so the other thing that's different about the system with, 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 with the, the nested series of primaries, secondaries, extra coils, top terminal, is understanding the voltage distribution and how it's not linear, and how you get massive compression at the top terminal is, is, the, is your ultimate goal, is to get this massive compression. And, um, and so the, where the ground's connected is actually a neutrality in the system. And so the idea is to accelerate the waveform and then essentially break it, stop it, really fast to create this electrostatic shock wave. And this is what Tesla works so hard to do, is how do we create this shock wave as efficient as possible? And the shock wave is a concept that people don't really understand in terms of how do you get uh, energy to be able delivered so far to a system over distance, which it normally cannot be. But to understand is if you're sending a particle through a medium, Okay, and this particle 
is, is moving at the speed in which the medium is able to transmit information. Say the speed of sound is around, I think, 763 miles per hour. I can't remember. Um, uh, 343 meters per second. It's my lucky number, 343. I think at sea level is the speed of sound. Um, and so if an object is moving at 343 meters per second, um, that means the sound waves it's creating um, are every single one it's propagating is moving at the same speed in which it's moving. And so when this happens, you have this, this insane form of resonance occurring at the tip of the object as it starts to move, creating a shock wave, but the shock wave grows. If you go faster than the speed of sound, the shock wave doesn't grow. If you go slower than the speed of sound, you get no shock wave. But if you travel right at the speed of sound, you get this shock wave that starts to build, where you're getting overlapping waveform over overlapping waveform. And that means the farther you travel, the greater amplitude that acquires in the system. This is what Tesla talked about with uh, transmitting power over greater distance, and you actually get more power out of greater distance. Because if you can maintain this particle moving through this medium at the speed of the medium, you, you essentially, your waveform becomes a battery. It stores the energy. It's, in, it's essentially a moving standing wave. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a phenomenal concept. And so uh, the idea with this system, as I said, is how do we create a fractal com compression? It's a fractal shock wave. And with it, you can deliver massive amounts of energy while at the same time self-organizing massive amounts of energy. And uh, I hopefully, uh, I need to get a, a webcam, and, but uh, I, I think my good mic works on this computer. I'm going to start doing some Skype and maybe a radio show or something. I, I need to talk more about the system and get collaboration on the system. Uh, I'm sort of alone in the dark on planet Earth when it comes to working on this system. Uh, there's very few people that I can actually talk about. Uh, Elizabeth Rauscher and Andrew Murray are probably the only two I've met. Love those two. Um, I would really love to work with Elizabeth Rauscher. Um, but I hope that there was some coherency in, in what I was sharing. Um, but the idea with this is, is, yeah, how do we create a fractal shockwave? And there's more, there's more concepts to the system. You can get into material science, you can get electromagnetic theory. Um, there's uh, an understanding of scalar theory. And so another important thing is the, the extra coil in the system. So I'll also share about this guy right here is these six windings, they all cancel out. There's no magnetic field being created. And so, uh, I mean, there'll be, there'll be a little bit, uh, but there's, there's, there's essentially it's canceling out. And these are all getting pulsed, all three circuits, at the same time. The, and so uh, everything's in resonance with itself. The difference is how do we create a polyphase signal? And so the polyphase is based on amplitude, not on phasing of the actual uh, individual signal. So instead of saying the primary the external primary coupling to the internal primary, this is an issue I dealt with for a while, and it'd be interesting to hear people's opinions on it, uh, is you could have three external primaries coupling one, two, three, one, two, three, and so each, each uh, winding is getting lit up. But no, they're all getting lit up at the exact same time. They're all perfectly in phase with each other, and they're all canceling out, so there's no magnetic field. And so you're creating a polyphase uh, uh, scalar field or scalar axis, this polyphase standing wave um, in the ether. The, the terminology isn't really, I say, fully there with the science when we talk about, but everything that's moved me forward on this for five years is intuition. And it's the intuition that has brought forward the science and what I need to research and study to help fill in the gaps and, and take you out of, you know, heebie-jeebie science, which a lot of people like to slam me on, and bring me actually something concrete which we actually even have to do t with Western science. So we gotta bring out some of the bullshit that it's become into something concrete. And so common sense, uh, intuition, and, and then just pure science, uh, the true heart of experimentation, bringing this all together, uh, 
I honestly feel that something uh, beautiful can come forth out of this. I mean, it's, it's, it's in here all the time, every day. Uh, it's hard for me not to think about it. And so the, the interesting thing um, that, that creates this polyphase signal is the spark gap. And if you have a rotary spark gap, and the spark gap causes a discharge of one, two, three, instead of the primary coupling being one, two, three, that you have three different amplitudes. And so you could say you have, when the, when the primary couples with all three, um, it, it'll, essentially what would happen is they all build up resonance together. And then all of a sudden you like turn on the spark gap or you spin the spark gap and then it discharges one. And then it discharges two, it discharges three, but it, the discharge is in, is in is a harmonic, if not the direct resonant frequency, of the of the primary that's coupling into the three circuits, the external one, and so which sort of relates to like uh, if you have a seven around one, which or you can say one around three. There's an external circuit that stimulates all three of these circuits at the same time, and that's that's another system to describe was what's stimulating it, and that relates to the ionosphere. And so there, this is taking multiple levels of Tesla's concept of his tower, which he usually uses with a single monopole circuit, and creating this elaborate uh, geometrical system to do something that I'm not even sure if Tesla was even envisioning doing. Because um, this also can, you can interact with this system, which I even got to with one of the hexagram coils, which is right here. This is all based off the same geometry. This is Star of David hexagram made out of steel. And it's internally magnetized. I'm interested in magnetizing them externally also. That's one thing I want to try. Um, and then also a quartz crystal. And so these are all geometries of a specific pattern that are interacting in a specific way. It allows me to create harmony in the system. And so I could even elaborate on how those would create the system. But the top terminals, essentially, allows for the effective stimulation or right timing of this system. And essentially, this becomes a battery. It store massive amounts of energy. And it can even levitate and spin within the system. Uh, but with the uh, actual tower, um, what was the concept? With uh, the three circuits all canceling out, uh, A brain fart. It's one of those moments. Um, but there, the, it generates no magnetic field. This, there's not a radio tower. It's not putting off EM into the field. It's breaking it. It's stopping it and creating an electrostatic shock wave instead of an electromagnetic uh, wave or even shock wave, which is known as Chukhanov radiation. Um, we're not trying to create Chukhanov radiation here. Is, at least as far as I understand is there's still a world of experimentation and see what happens and there's even physics I don't know there's plenty of physics I don't know there's plenty of math I don't know um, but I'm figuring out what I do know um, uh, but we're creating this uh, this polyphase um, signal and so essentially if you're looking at the signal that's going through this tower if it's discharging at a harmonic on which the primary couples, and let's say they're, they're, they're perfectly equal, there's no overtones or, um, or undertones within the system, then basically it couples, everything's raised by, you could say, a third power in the circuit. Um, and which is if everything's sort of running normally, not the startup, because the startup would have to get into, you could say, working motion, um, that one's at third power, one's at two-thirds power, and one's at full power. But the one that reaches full power, uh, it creates enough voltage to where the spark gap can fire and the spark gap discharges. Um, and the uh, um, and so that's one of the things that I'm trying to do differently is instead of putting the primary on the, ex or the capacitor in, in spark gap, which you could also have two of them, on the external primary, you put it on the internal primary, or the internal three circuits, not the external circuit that stimulates it. And so uh, when that happens, the capacitor, the, the charge that's stored in the capacitor around the, one of the three primaries in the, the three circuits, that discharges. 
And so you have three different levels of voltage in each of these circuits. Um, I'm sorry, not voltage, um, amplitude, uh, even though the, the voltage is going to be affected as well, obviously. Um, three different, you could say, uh, amount of energy. <laughs> uh, it's it's going to relate more to amperage. Even though you're really not trying to get amperage, and so there's going to be so little amperage, it's going to be voltage. There's going to be greater pressure in the third circuit that reaches the point to where you can have a voltage breakdown um, of the spark gap, and then that one, and then you have a massive discharge. And so, essentially, all three of them are in resonance. All three of them are canceling out. But one of them, the one that's the highest voltage ring, has the massive discharge. And so, essentially, the tower is going bam, 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 bam. Um, you're, you're getting it's like a thumper in Dune. And so you're creating this polyphase shock wave. And so this is the difference concept with what Tesla's working with, even though he figured out the polyphase is how do we keep creating these shock waves? And how do we do them in a specific reference or relationship to space and time, geometry and phasing? So this is the, this is the basic idea to my system. Um, and I'm going to keep working on it. I'm just going to keep posting videos, sharing about it. Um, if you have questions about going into a specific detail in the system, uh, I've only covered an overview. So much is up in my head. I do have things in my notes and, and Excel sheets and whatever. Lots up in my head. So uh, questions really help me move forward with this system. I'm going to probably be doing some sort of fundraiser, maybe even just a YouTube fundraiser to help build parts for the extra coil. Um, the carbon fiber is not cheap. Um, I have gone some forms of testing tools, uh, even though I've lost a lot of my stuff with the drama that's taken place over the next two years, over the last two years. Um, but I'm still optimistic, still moving forward. Tesla would be proud to see the advancements of humankind, at least in this level of consciousness to where we're going to bring forth a new golden age upon us. It's just miraculous. I cannot wait. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day. Blessings. Ah.